Every province across Canada is gearing up to start administering COVID-19 vaccines for kids under the age of five. Health Canada has just approved the Moderna vaccine for the youngest children, and parents are sure to have some questions about how best to prepare their young ones. Now, thankfully, we have one of Canada's foremost experts in needle fear and pain to answer some of those questions on today's podcast. My name is Eric Bowman. I'm the communications person at the Canadian Psychological Association, and this is Mindful. My guest today has been working in the area of needle fears and needle pain in both children and adults for a good portion of her career. We're going to talk about what causes these fears, how to deal with them, and how best to prepare children, including infants, for procedures involving a needle. You'll hear many references to available resources throughout the episode, and I encourage you to check the show notes for direct links to those resources. Now let's meet our guest. My name is Dr. Megan McMurtry, and I'm a clinical and health psychologist by training. I'm an associate professor at the University of Guelph, and I'm also a psychologist with the Pediatric Chronic Pain Program at McMaster Children's Hospital. So tell me a little bit about that work up until now. Uh, We're going to talk about kids, and we're going to talk about needles and that kind of thing. But just as the pandemic began, working with kids in pain, uh, what's that been like? So I think the pandemic has been challenging for people in so many kind of different ways. I know within our pediatric chronic pain program, we were finding that for some of our patients, things actually seem to be going a little bit better for them um, in terms of enjoying being home and being able to have kind of their own schedule instead of needing to go to school. But of course, for many others, it was much more challenging. On the acute pain side, for many of us, we've been focused on how to make make vaccines uh, more comfortable for people across the lifespan and knowing that for children, they're a particularly vulnerable group uh, to when we don't manage their pain and their distress during these procedures. So this has been kind of an area of attention for a number of us in Canada and across the world. And the pandemic has really heightened interest, I would say, in some of the research that we do, as well as some of the strategies that we know can be helpful. And so in some ways, it's an exciting time trying to get the message out to people. Um, But it's also really challenging because, of course, no one would wish um, this pandemic on anybody. And it has been exciting to see the vaccinations, um, you know, be developed uh, and to be able to have these vaccines to help. And of course, there's been a number of us who've been involved in um, trying to increase vaccine acceptance among the general population. So one area for me is around how needle fear can get in the way and cause people to really not want to go and get their vaccines. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm wondering uh, about that in general, right? Needle fear is a big thing for many, many people. And uh, we've been talking for a lot uh, of this podcast season about uh, conspiracy theories and the people who, you know, spread disinformation about vaccines is part of, and, and a lot of that seems to stem from fear, right? There's fear of this pandemic that's happening all around the world. It's an uncertain time in many ways. Uh, is the needle fear compounding that if you have a fear of needles are you more likely to start believing something that means you don't have to take one that's a really interesting question i think vaccine hesitancy we know is incredibly complex And this has been something that has been the focus of some of the work that um, the World Health Organization has been doing for years. So I'm not an expert on vaccine hesitancy sort of generally, but I will say in terms of what we know about needle fear, that it really can get in the way of people wanting to go um, and get their vaccinations. So we knew this long before the pandemic, that when individuals have a negative experience uh, when they get a needle, they can actually have short and long-term consequences. So the short-term consequences can include, you know, increased procedure time, increased use of restraint, increased chance of injury, negative memories of the procedure. And longer term, it can lead to really significant fear that leads to avoidance, actually, of the procedure, so say of vaccines, but it can also generalize over time so that someone who had a negative experience, for example, with a vaccination, 
initially avoids vaccinations, but then might start to avoid their going to their doctor's office in general, and then maybe even seeking other kinds of medical care. Maybe they stop going to the dentist. So in the most sort of severe cases, we know that this fear can really become quite impairing. Now, I read in the excellent piece that you wrote in the conversation about this. And uh, one of the things that you're saying, and I think this makes a lot of sense, is that one of the reasons you want to make sure that children have the best possible experience with a vaccination, with a needle procedure, uh, when they're young, is that this doesn't develop over time. So I'm wondering if children uh, who do have a fear of needles, a fear of that kind of pain, is that always learned from a bad experience or do they go in with that fear before it even happens and you know then have to manage it from there okay another great question uh eric yeah so uh there's certainly lots of theories about how fears can kind of develop so rockman had his sort of three pathways of transmission of fear which really essentially said you know we can have a negative experience ourselves we can watch somebody else have a negative experience and we can hear negative information also from others and any one of those pathways can kind of lead to somebody developing a fear we do know from studies uh, with adults who have high levels of needle fear that they report having a previous negative experience most of the time. So that of course has some limitations because there's retrospective reporting, but it does tell us that these negative experiences are really important. We also know that from the pediatric procedural pain literature in which it has been clearly demonstrated that when we don't manage pain in infancy and early childhood, it can have significant negative consequences later on. So for example, uh, my colleague and collabor collaborator, Dr. Anna Taddeo, showed that when baby boys underwent circumcision without benefit of any pain reducing medications, they showed increased behavioral response at their six month immunizations compared to baby boys who did receive pain management um, interventions and medication during their circumcisions, right? So right. it's really quite um, remarkable actually what can kind of happen. So when we think about this, we really want to consider uh, the number of needle procedures that children undergo during childhood. So. When we think about the vaccination um, schedule for healthy children, there's well over 20 needles, even before COVID, not even counting the flu shot, before somebody reaches the age of 18, right? Yeah. So if we aren't managing the pain, fear, and distress from these procedures, that really starts to add up. And we know that needle fear, the average age of onset, is somewhere between sort of five and seven years old. Well, guess when we got a lot of pokes, right, around that time as well. Um, and so it really is kind of coming together to sort of suggest that we really have an ethical uh, responsibility to manage pain and fear around these procedures. So getting back to your question, though, we know that pain and fear can really exacerbate each other, right? So right. if I've had a negative experience before, or if I'm going in maybe with some negative expectations, I am more likely to experience more pain in the moment. And then experiencing more pain in that moment is also more likely to lead me to be more fearful in the future, right? And we need to think about these in kind of a longitudinal way where children are, you know, having many needle procedures. And these are just healthy children we're talking about. Children with chronic illnesses like cancer or diabetes can have many more needle procedures, of course. But they're needing to undergo many procedures and then they might become adults who have children of their own and then they're trying to help their own children cope during these procedures and that can be really challenging for someone who has high levels of needle fear I, i'm going to demonstrate my decided lack of medical knowledge here you mentioned circumcision and then the response that uh, came about uh, six months later with uh, a vaccination like that normally happens with very small babies, I think, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you are not old enough yet to throw a temper tantrum in the doctor's office and to, you know, actively resist as a five or six year old might be able to. And I think that we think of immunizing babies and that sort of thing is a little bit easier because they don't really have the ability to 
consent to not consent, it's very difficult to know whether you're making them comfortable or not. How important is that? And and what can people do like at that stage of life when you are nonverbal and you're a super small child? Yeah, so, oh my goodness, so glad that you asked this. So first of all, there used to be a misconception that babies didn't feel pain. And we now know that that is just completely incorrect. Okay. Um, and so you're right that they're nonverbal. They're not going to use words to tell us how much pain that they're having. But we do have behavioral measures of pain where we can watch their behavior to help us understand how much pain they're experiencing. And we also know of pain management strategies that can absolutely benefit infants. So for example, as part of our Help Eliminate Pain in Kids and Adults national team, we undertook a series of really um, rigorous systematic reviews of the literature to understand how to minimize vaccination related pain and distress across the lifespan. So this was back in, we started in 2013, things are published 2015, 2016, and we have a couple of clinical practice guidelines from that as well. So what do we say about infants, right? So what we say is that actually here are the strategies that can be helpful. Number one is if infants are breastfed anyway, breastfeeding actually during vaccinations is really helpful. Mm. If they're not breastfed, um, they can be bottle fed also during their vaccinations. They can also be given sugar water ahead of time. So it's just a little bit of sugar with mixed with water, um, also called sort of sucrose, right? And that um, appears to help with their behavioral response um, to pain. We ask the caregivers to hold them in a comfortable position. And very young babies, like in the first month of life, can be um, held skin to skin with a caregiver. Infants can also benefit from the use of topical anesthetics that we recommend actually across the lifespan. So these are medications that numb the skin um, where the needle will be inserted and that they can even be used uh, in babies and that can be really helpful. The other thing is that we wanna make sure the caregiver for babies and, and even for older children is calm. Right. So as a caregiver, it can be quite distressing um, to have your child undergo a needle procedure. But the more that you can be calm, you can then help your child focus on coping through the procedure. So for babies, it might look a little bit different. Right. Um, but holding them sort of gently, you know, rocking them and speaking to them in a calm voice is really helpful. So parents might need to take some deep breaths to help themselves as well. You were saying that most adults, uh, almost all adults who have a fear response to needles uh, have had a negative experience with them in the past, which is what has led them to this fear of needles as an adult. Is it more prevalent in children who may not yet have had that negative uh, experience with needles than it is in adults? Or does it sort of, is it the same level of fear across all age groups? Okay, so we know um, that fear, some level of fear of needles is very common. So I think it's first important to talk about how fear and anxiety exist on spectrums, right, from low to high. So we know that about two in every three children and one in every four adults has some fear of needles. Okay, so somewhere on the spectrum, they're, they're there. But about one in 10 have a severe fear of needles. So fear of needles is more common in childhood and it does like, se like severe fear as well as more mild fears. And they, it does tend to reduce across the lifespan, but for individuals with that more severe fear, that's not just gonna go away on its own. It's going to need um, targeted treatment. Okay, so on that spectrum, like when I go and get my COVID shot, it goes in my shoulder, I have no problem with it, I'm not worried about it at all, but when I go to give blood and they put it in the vein in my arm, that's a little more freaky for me, and I don't like okay. to look at it while they do that. Is that mm -hmm. on the level of some form of needle fear that I don't like to look at them doing it? Yeah, so I would consider that probably quite mild, to be honest. It seems to be very specific to the venipuncture context, and it's not getting in the way at all 
of what um, you know of, of you actually pursuing the the intervention or the the needle procedure. But I would say it's mild in terms of the con the context for having your blood drawn, right? And you may say that it's about seeing the blood, or I'm not sure. You know, do you know what it is about it that bothers you? I don't know. It, it's the I think it's seeing the specific vein that the needle then goes mm -hmm. into or mm -hmm. artery vein, whatever. See, not a medical doctor. I don't know what <laughs> they stick the needle in, but that part of the arm, right? It's not going into the fatty part, the muscle part, the shoulder, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. It's going into something very specific. And I think seeing that, the, a feeling like they need that level of precision, I'm afraid to look at it in case something goes awry. I don't know. But they miss, maybe. Or something. Maybe, yeah. I've never had so, that happen, but no but you're concerned about it and so this actually brings me to one of the points i think is really important here so fear is can often be very idiosyncratic right what you're going to be afraid of and worried about may not be the same thing as what i'm afraid of or, or worried about and you know that's okay we just need to know what bothers us right and trying to figure out kind of how to help so for you, it doesn't sound like it's actually anything to do with the pain. No. No. So that I think is really important. And I, you know, many years ago now, maybe 2011, I stood up at a pain conference and I was presenting some information and, and I said, well, we don't really actually necessarily know all the time what people are afraid of when they talk about being afraid of needles. And there were many people, I think, in the audience who thought, what is it? Is she completely out to lunch? And some people said, well, of course, they're afraid of the pain. And they had just made that de facto kind of that's that's the answer. And I said, well, where is the research data to tell us that? So in part, we can rely on data around when we don't manage pain properly, fear can develop. So for sure, pain can be important. But if you've talked to the number of people that I've talked to who, who don't like needles and are afraid of, afraid of them, you figure out pretty quickly, there's many reasons that people report being kind of weirded out or afraid of or disgusted by needles, some of which has to do with pain. Others like you, you know, I don't like the look of it going into to my vein. I don't like them trying to search and find a vein really bothers me. That's not about pain, right? And so it's going to become important actually for us to know what people are afraid of in designing our interventions. So one of the big things I want to make sure that I'm clear on during this podcast is that there are sort of two broad kind of categories of interventions for people who have kind of lower, possibly moderate needle fear and are concerned about pain. We have all sorts of really great evidence-based strategies for managing pain and low fear around the time of the needle. Right. Then we have those individuals who have more of a high level of fear regarding needles and they want to avoid those needles they want to escape where in where they're in the context of a needle because that that's what we do when we're really anxious we want to avoid when we're really fearful in that situation we want to escape so for those folks they actually need a different intervention before they're going to benefit from all those pain management strategies Right. I was talking to our graphic designer, Adam, a couple of days ago, and he just took his young, young son in to get uh, his vaccine. And he threw a tantrum and freaked out and didn't want anything to do with it. And the doctors took him into an office by himself and they talked to him for a long time, like 20 minutes, half an hour, something like that, to get him comfortable with it. Finally, he took it. And then Adam tells me that for the rest of the week and month, he's been smug about it. By, you know, obnoxiously smug, telling all of his friends, it's no big deal, you know. <laughs> So cute, right? Well, good for him for getting it done. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, though, if that is something that is one of the uh, interventions that you recommend is seeing other people get it done and having no adverse reaction and that sort of thing. Uh, and would you recommend that? I mean, if you've got a bunch of five-year-olds and they're watching other five-year-olds get it done, as long as those other five-year-olds don't freak out, then you're going to be fine, right? But if one of them does, I can't imagine that being good for anyone. 
So we know the social learning context and what's called kind of emotional contagion can be really important here. So I was part of a World Health Organization um, subcommittee for the Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety. And we were asked to really take a closer look at what was known as um, adverse events that were related to anxiety um, and vaccinations. And so we have now reconceptualized those and really understood them to be immunization stress related responses. The reason I'm talking about it is because we know that in mass clinics where there's lots of people, you know, getting their vaccinations, if people are witnessing others having adverse events, even if those events have nothing to do with the actual vaccine and anything actually being wrong with the vaccine. If you witness someone getting dizzy or fainting, it's going to drive up your fear levels and put you at greater risk. And so when we witness other people struggling, it's a huge problem. And actually between witnessing firsthand and also social media, we've seen um, even before the pandemic, there have been countries where their entire vaccination program has been derailed. And again, it's not for a reason to do with the vaccine. It's because of something happening within the clinic kind of delivery. So the idea of watching someone confidently undergo a needle procedure and show you how to cope, great idea. The problem is that you want to make sure that's what happens, not watching somebody where there's something that happens that was unexpected. So we actually, as part of the comfort, ask, relax, and distract system, card system that was developed by Dr. Anatadio, and I'm part of the team also, that system actually has advice and sort of checklists and approaches that can be used by people who are setting up the vaccination clinics, by the clinicians, caregivers, and the individuals being vaccinated. So when setting up a clinic, for example, you want to have kind of one way um, traffic or people flow, and you don't want people on display, you know, having their vaccinations. It's not only a little bit nerve wracking for the person getting the vaccination. Also, while you're waiting, that could be um, disconcerting if you see someone having what you perceive to be a negative kind of reaction, right? Because right. we do some people faint um, during needles, um, and we can talk about that as well. Yeah, I when I got my vaccination done and uh, my wife went with me and we were in a big community center gym and there are all these tables lined up and everybody sees everybody getting it all done, right? I assumed that was the most uh, efficient way to do it because you are trying to mass vaccinate as many people as you can, as quickly as you can. The, the one thing that I thought of might be a little freaky for people is that then everybody sits in the waiting area after you get your vaccination so they could monitor you and make sure that you're fine with it. But I can see people being like, I really don't like the idea that something could go wrong while I'm sitting in these hard wooden chairs in a high school gymnasium, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so for children, it seems like they're trying to do it a little more one on one, a little less uh, in a mass situation. But would you recommend for adults as well, uh, not having that kind of a, a setup? So this is a tricky situation, right? Because we also want to, you know, there are people whose um, focus is going to be on the efficiency of delivery, right? So um, I think mass vaccination clinics that are well run can work quite well. Um, so we do know that standing, like prolonged standing, um, can be a trigger for someone fainting. So you want to have ways of addressing that. So not having huge long lineups, so having appointments, having places where people can sit, you know, clearly moving from one station to the next, having barriers to set up sort of private spaces for people getting their vaccinations. And I think one, one thing that maybe hasn't been done as much of is really uh, allowing people to self-identify if they have a higher fear of needles because they are at more risk for experiencing an immunization stress-related response. So giving them a little bit more time, allowing them to have um, more kind of coping strategies in place and, you know, having a support person present and so on. Having those kind of um, specialty clinics, I think, is really important. 
There are some examples of those. So CAMH has, um, has a series of clinics that they've done um, to try to help uh, different individuals. And then also in the Guelph area, I know we have um, sort of a particular sensory, um, high sensory needs uh, clinic as well. But this is something that we should really be considering for those who kind of self-identify as needing more help. We cannot put the onus solely on the people who are getting a vaccination. We also have a responsibility for those who are developing the clinics as well. And this is true, I would say, across the lifespan. Certainly for kids, they have a higher risk of having um, high needle fear. For younger children, they're at less risk of having a vasovagal. A vasovagal reaction is when someone feels dizzy, they might see spots, they might feel shaky, and if it's most extreme, someone might actually faint or have vasovagal syncope. We know that in individuals who have high levels of needle fear, that response is more common. Not everyone who faints is afraid of needles, and not everyone who's afraid of needles faints, but there is a higher degree of overlap than you would expect by chance. Right. So it tends to be the anxiety and the fear of the needle that produce the fainting reaction more so than the needle itself. Is that accurate? Well, it's pretty complicated, actually. So, so for one, seeing blood and pain are two common, like are triggers often for basal vagal syncope. Right. We know that people who have the most extreme form of high needle fear, which is called blood injection injury phobia. So those people, it's like around four to 5% of the population actually have the diagnosis. They're more at risk for fainting. And there is also a genetic component of this fainting response. This is unique among all the phobias. So if I have a phobia of spiders or arachnophobia, I am not more likely to faint. But it turns out, actually, if I have blood injection injury phobia, I'm more likely to show that response than someone else in the typical population. So why does this matter? It means that if you have a high fear of needles, you may be at more risk for experiencing basal vagal syncope or basal vagal reaction. And if you do have that experience, that can be really fear inducing as well. So it can then become an exacerbating issue over time. We do have an intervention that's quite simple to put in place to help. So a vasovagal reaction is thought to occur because someone's heart rate and blood pressure speed up and then they suddenly drop. And that leads to the feelings of faintness or actually fainting. If we use a technique called muscle tension in which major muscle groups of the body are tensed, until somebody feels flushed in their face and then released just back to baseline, not fully relaxed, just tensed, then released. That helps maintain their blood pressure, which then stops any um, kind of feelings of faintness. Okay. Is that why when you give blood, they make you squeeze that ball? Probably, yeah. That and also that it may help um, yeah, with the blood flow, right, is another um, reason they may be doing that, right? Right. Yeah. I just assumed that it was to, you know, increase the blood pressure so they could get yeah. it over with quicker. Your blood comes That's right. Because by, by increasing the blood pressure, they're increasing the blood flow, right? I mean, it's, they work together. Yeah. Yeah. So are there people then who are so afraid of needles that we're never going to get them vaccinated? Or is there an intervention for absolutely everyone? Yeah, so I would like to think that there's an intervention for absolutely everybody. We have the strategies that work for people with low and moderate fear, and I, I would like to talk about those in terms of pain management. We also have strategies that can absolutely be helpful for individuals with high levels of fear, and these are known as exposure-based therapy. So basically, this is under the umbrella of cognitive behavioral therapy, an exposure asks someone to face their fear in a gradual and controlled way over and over again. Now, it's important to remember that this is for fears that are out of proportion to the danger post, right? Because right. you wouldn't want someone facing their fear of something that was actually like very dangerous, right? So, right. In, yeah. So in exposure, what happens is an individual first creates a list of situations related, in this case, to the needle of which they're afraid. So for example, it could be even talking about needles. It could be looking at a picture of a plastic needle versus a real needle, 
holding a toy needle, holding a real needle, watching somebody through a video get an injection, watching someone get an injection really live and in person. These are just examples. And what they do is they actually rate their fear from say zero, no fear at all, to 10, the most fear possible, how afraid they are of each of those situations. So the, what I'm gonna be afraid of is not necessarily gonna be the same as what somebody else is going to be afraid of. So getting their ratings is important. They then order the ratings or the situations from lowest to highest in terms of their fear ratings. And this becomes their fear hierarchy or ladder. So just like when you climb a real ladder, you start from the bottom and you work your way up and you don't skip a step, right? So you would start with something that's rated a one or a two out of 10, and you would face that fear over and over again until it dropped to zero. And then you move on to the next step and so on. So the reason that this works is because it's asking someone to basically face their catastrophic belief or the thing they're most worried about is going to happen. And when they actually experience that they can survive the situation that their um, most feared thing is not going to happen, they gain confidence that they can manage it. They learn over time that their fear will come down. Right. right. And even if the thing that they were most worried about is going to happen, they're going to learn that they can survive it because, again, the fear is out of proportion to the danger posed. So over time, what we see is people become more and more confident on the basis of their own experience that they can do this. Right. And it's not as bad as they once thought. So this is why just asking somebody to put in place pain management strategies when they have really high levels of needle fear isn't likely to be enough. Because when someone kind of comes in to get a needle and they have really high levels of fear, they're already at 10 out of 10 when they're in the waiting room. Right. Doesn't really matter if you put in place the pain management strategies because those will help with the pain, but they don't necessarily help with all of the fear kind of leading up to it, right? Yes. Yeah. So, Acting as if these um, pain management strategies will help with high levels of meal fear is like assuming they stay at the low kind of end of their fear until they hit pain or experience any pain and then suddenly jump up. But if they don't have pain, then they'll stay low. But if you talk to people, they're like, I'm terrified when I'm booking my appointment or, you know, when I'm in the waiting room or I can't even get my child in the car. They're so afraid. So they need to, these people need to be able to gain experience themselves um, to show that they can do it. And then they can ban it, um, benefit from those pain management strategies, which are also really important. So for parents who do have a child who can barely get into the car, who is uh, absolutely terrified, I think the instinct for parents might be to say, hey, we're going to go get ice cream and then, ha ha ha, sucker, I got you. We're at the doctor's office, right? I'm going to guess you would advise against that. Uh, and, you know, what, what are some of the strategies that you give parents for, you know, children who are so terrified of this that you think they'll never get in there? Yeah, so you're right. I, I would not recommend that parents try to trick their children. Now, I, I want to emphasize that parents are doing the very best they can, and so are clinicians, right? And unfortunately, sometimes what we think might be helpful may not actually be helpful. So it's important for children who have a high fear of needles to engage in this, this exposure-based work right, with their caregiver at home so that they can gain confidence and I know what's going to happen. I know that I can cope during it because I've done it. I know I can be brave because I've been brave and I've done this before. And it's much better to do the work, even though it's, it's not easy um, and I, you know, it does take effort. But I would argue that it's very important to do the work ahead of time so that you can set your child up for the most um, successful needle procedure they can have. Ultimately, this isn't about just getting one single needle procedure done. And I think we often tend to think about it that way. And I think that's really problematic. All of us will undergo numerous medical, medical procedures throughout the course of our life. And if we don't manage our, you know, needle related pain and fear, then it becomes more and more of a problem over time. 
So we can't just look at it as I'm weighing, you know, um, the, the cost of getting her through this one procedure, you know, um, by lying and tricking her versus not doing anything at all. Two things are important here. One is that when we think about painful medical procedures, even if they're designed to help, they can be perceived as traumatic by those who are experiencing them particularly if pain and fear management strategies have not been used. And trauma in this way is in the eye of the beholder. It's not about the objective severity of, say, the needle procedure. It's about the child, say, response to it. And we know this. So that has to be weighed against any kind of impetus to just get through that one single procedure. I would say that's not our goal, actually. Our goal is to empower our children and know that they have practiced and they know how to help themselves and how other people will help them through these procedures, that they feel confident and empowered in going for future procedures and learn to take an active role in their health care. So they become adults also who are really actively engaged in their health care. And the risk is that if we, you know, use things like restraint and we force children and others to undergo procedures, unless they're emergency procedures, without their consent and their kind of willingness to cooperate, we're creating a situation where someone's going to want to, to avoid the situation entirely or escape when they're in it. Now, you talked about, you know, being involved in their own medical care and being active participants. I imagine one of those things is being able to verbalize what it is that frightens them so much about having the needles done. And I imagine that parents and adults in general uh, have sort of a disconnect there because they can see how harmless this procedure actually is, right? And, and the disproportionate fear of it might be very confusing. What are some of the ways that you might want to talk your kid through it so that they can explain what it is that is terrifying them about that? It can be hard depending on the child's age and developmental stage to get really good answers from them. But around the age of say seven, children can certainly start to tell you what it is that worries them about the needles. Even five-year-olds, for example, can tell you certain aspects of it. So sometimes when we're actually trying to generate that list of the situations that make us afraid, right? it would be helpful for say a parent to toss out potential suggestions. Is it wait, what, how's waiting in the waiting room for you? Is that okay? You know, um, asking them kinds of questions like that and really listening to the child's answer can help. Um, for really younger children, I think um, it is more difficult. And so you may want to give like head to head comparisons. Is this better or is this better? Right? right. Or which one is worse between these two things? The other thing is of course, when we want to prepare anybody for a medical procedure or a needle procedure in particular, people need to understand what it is they're being asked to do, why they're being asked to do it, how it's going to feel, and how they can cope and other people will help them cope, you know, during the procedure. So I think adults often take that for granted. But for children, they don't know the answers to most of those questions unless someone walks them through it before the procedure. And that's really important. So sometimes parents get concerned because they say, well, so in terms of how the procedure is going to feel, what should I say? So we do suggest not saying that it won't hurt because usually it does hurt. And we also want to not emphasize, um, you know, the negative. So instead, we can say things like uh, some children say that it pinches for a few seconds when you get, say, the COVID vaccine. Others say it was over with before they could believe it. After you get it, you can tell me what it was like for you. Now, there's been just a massive mobilization of science all around the world to do all kinds of incredible things in the last year and a half, right? Uh, we got vaccines that we never thought we could get so quickly. It's uh, been an incredible thing. And you are doing a lot of this research in this space, kids and pain and needles and so on. I'm wondering what you've been doing in the research space in this time and what are we doing differently now as a result uh, than we would have been doing, say, in January of 2020 uh, when it comes to kids and pain management and needles and that sort of thing. So I think one of the, the biggest things that has been happening is there's been a mobilization of really lots of efforts to get the knowledge that we have in the scientific literature out to the public. 
So a great example is the Solutions for Kids in Pain Knowledge Mobilization Network, which I believe pre-existed uh, the pandemic and certainly the It Doesn't Have to Hurt campaign. That was, you know, Dr. Christine Chambers started these and she really worked very hard to get the evidence that we had in the literature out to those who need it. So I would say she and, and uh, her colleagues, including um, Dr. Katie Burney, are still doing that. And they're both psychologists, by the way. Um, but also, there are many other people who are doing more of that as well. And so I see that as being quite different in terms of the attention that's being paid by the mainstream media, actually, in wanting to talk to us about how do we manage pain and fear? How do we understand them? What can we do to kind of make these procedures better? So some of the, the research that we have um, done and are trying to mobilize comes from that help eliminate pain in kids and adults team and big knowledge synthesis that I talked about before, because really our clinical practice guideline for managing um, vaccine related pain and fear was endorsed by the World Health Organization back in 2015. And we had about 50 different statements or guidance statements for what clinicians should and shouldn't be doing, what parents should and shouldn't be doing to manage needle related pain. More recently, and again, this is led by Anna Tadio and I, I collaborate closely with her. We actually studied how to make this clinical practice guideline actionable in, in terms of the school vaccination context. And so through that came that comfort, ask, relax, and distract or card system and framework. So that was actually developed and tested. How do we actually get the knowledge out there to the people setting up clinics, to clinicians, to parents and children um, in terms of managing needle related pain, fear and fainting. So that's where CARD started, but actually a lot of what's been done in the last couple of years is expanding the context in which we can use CARD. And I will say, I'm not sure if you can link to any of the resources or anything, but there is, there's a hub, a learning hub that has all sorts of different resources related to CARD. And so I find that um, to be really exciting because it's being used by many different sort of public health agencies and so on. And so really getting that um, evidence that we have from the literature out there. So that's on the pain and kind of low fear management um, areas. I personally have been trying to also engage with the public by letting them know about how to treat high levels of needle fear. So we have a research project that's funded through the Public Health Agency of Canada that's looking at an accessible e-resource for adults with high levels of needle fear so that they can kind of self-guide them themselves through the process. The other thing that we're doing is, and we, we just did one last night, we held a virtual free workshop for parents of children with high levels of needle fear, going over, you know, how do we understand fear? How do we help with this issue? What are pain management strategies as well when the fear is has been addressed? Really, again, trying to make that information accessible for those who need it. Well, great. I'm glad that you're doing all of that. And yes, to answer your question, I can put uh, some links uh, in the show notes here for this podcast. So we do know that there's lots of science-backed strategies that can be helpful for pain and low fear around the time of the needle. And that starts with preparing your child about what to expect on the day uh, that they're getting the needle procedure. Where are they going to go? Who's going to be there? How is it going to feel? Don't assume that they know this information and also don't assume that you shouldn't provide this information because children will often kind of fill in the blanks with information that might actually be scarier than the reality. So you want to make sure they have accurate information. You can use topical anesthetics, which are numbing creams to help numb the area where the needle will be inserted. Children should be told that they would still feel some pressure, so that's not going to be the absence of any sensation, but it, it will reduce the pain for sure. During the needle, there's lots of other strategies that can be used, including distraction. So they can be playing a game, they can be singing with you, you can be talking about other things. Uh, I know for my own child, he likes to have his noise cancelling headphones on and watching a show on the iPad. Um, and so that's what he's focused on instead of on the needle. 
And by the way, actually having something to do while you're waiting is really important too. And I do think the use of uh, noise canceling headphones can be helpful because then you're not hearing if anybody else is upset if it's a mass um, clinic kind of context. Right. So um, also, you know, for positioning in terms of younger children can be seated on their parents' lap. So the, the child's back can be to the parent's chest or they can be sort of stomach to stomach with the legs kind of wrapped around the parent's waist. That's really what the parent and the child prefers. And speaking of preferences, it's really important to listen to children about what they want in terms of to do to cope during these procedures. Do they want to look at the needle or do they want to look away? And these preferences should be supported whenever possible. So no child should be held down or pinned down or restrained in a way against their will when this is not an emergency procedure. We have specific recommendations around what to say at the time of the needle. So you can kind of come up with a, a neutral way to signal the onset of the procedure, like one, two, three, here we go. You can allow for differences in kind of how the procedure is going to feel by saying things you know, like, you know, I felt like it was like a pinch, but I know your brother told me he didn't even feel it. You can tell me what it was like for you afterwards. All great suggestions. Does any of this work on adults also? Like my wife has a bit of a fear if she puts on the noise canceling headphones and watches Grey's Anatomy on her iPad while she goes through, will it help? So absolutely. We do recommend that distraction can be helpful for adults. Topical anesthetics also can be helpful for adults. And the same strategies we recommend in terms of how to talk to people around the, the time of the needle also work for adults. A couple of things that people are often confused by. One is that uh, when parents and others use a lot of repetitive reassurance, it's okay, don't worry, you'll be fine. It's actually worse for the child and it seems to signal to the child that their parent is worried. So we suggest staying away from a lot of reassurance, instead kind of use distraction. The other thing that's important is that you know, allowing people to talk about their fears or, you know, how it felt for them. It's not a case of you're going to suggest, oh, if, if I ask about fear, then that's going to suggest they should be afraid. There's no evidence to suggest that's the case. But what it does is it allows a space for someone to feel like they're listened to and their experience is actually um, being valued. The other thing I want to touch on is what to do after the needle procedure. So there's recent work that shows that how we frame and talk about the procedure afterwards is important. So Melanie Knoll and colleagues at the University of Calgary and other psychologists um, did this work and they showed that when parents focused on neutral and positive experiences within the needle afterwards, it was helpful for children and that when um, if a child ever brought up kind of a negatively exaggerated memory, so something that wasn't actually accurate, it helped for parents to really get in there very quickly and make sure that actually they had an accurate understanding of what happened. We know that when children form accurate and positive memories about a needle procedure, they do better for future needle procedures. When they misremember certain aspects of it, like I screamed the whole time when in fact they didn't, that's going to lead to more sort of fear and pain at future procedures. And it's really important. So one way to help with this is to talk to your child afterwards about what went well. How were they brave? Find one thing or more than one thing that they did well that went well, even if overall it was a bit of a challenge. For my own child, um, often I'll take a video of him afterwards. So if he's quite calm and the procedure generally went well, I might take a video of him and I'll ask him about how did it go and how did we help you cope with your fear and pain? What did you do? What did I do? And what would you tell yourself for next time? And then that way I can actually play that video back for him another time before, before a future procedure so he can hear from himself exactly what it was like because he's more likely to believe himself than he is to believe me, to be honest. Right, yes. I like that. Videotape everybody after they come out. Play it back for a later date. That's great. Although if they're, you know, really struggling, that, that's not the best <clears throat> to be doing that. Hey. 
thank you for this. Uh, thanks for taking the time. It's been great. Thank you very much as well. Thank you for the opportunity to chat with you today. Many thanks to Dr. Megan McMurtry, not just for taking the time to speak with me today, but also for the work she and her team and the great people at Solutions for Kids in Pain and other organizations have been doing in the realm of needle pain and fear for all these years. If you're interested in any of the resources Dr. McMurtry mentioned today, please check the show notes for direct links to many of them. Now, thank you for tuning in to Mindful, which today was written, hosted, produced, edited, and published by me, Eric Bowman. As always, our theme music is Avenues by David Taylor. See you next week.